Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to a virtual Institute for Government for this IFG live discussion on the scrutiny of special advisors. My name is Tim Durrant, I'm Associate Director on our Minister's Programme uh, and I'm really glad that you're joining us today. Uh, special advisors in this government are attracting a lot of attention from Dominic Cummings and his trips around the country to Barnard Castle or more recently to various military sites. Uh, but we should also talk about David Frost, the chief negotiator with the EU and the incoming national security advisor, and Lee Kane, the director of communications, who, under a shakeup of government communications announced last week, will now oversee the work of press offices across government. But the role of special advisors across government within departments as well as within Number 10 is, is changing, and many of them are working much more closely with Number 10 than has been the case in the past. How much of this is new, and how much of this is what special advisors have always done? Is it a change to how all advisors work or is it just a select few and how much should the work and actions of special advisors be scrutinized separately from those of the minister that they're working for we have a great panel here to discuss all this and more so first off we are joined by lord barwell gavin barwell who was mp for croydon central a housing minister and after the 2017 general election chief of staff to prime minister theresa may uh, gavin was also a special advisor uh, to john gummer in the last few years of the major government in the 1990s Secondly, we're joined by Sir David Liddington, who was in government from 2010 to 2019. He was Secretary of State for Justice and most recently Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and de facto Deputy to Theresa May. He was also Special Advisor, working with Douglas Hurd at the Home Office and Foreign Office in the 1980s. Polly McKenzie is our third panellist. She is the Chief Executive of Demos, the cross-party think tank. Uh, she served as Director of Policy to Nick Clegg while he was Deputy Prime Minister in the 2010 to 2015 coalition government. And finally, my colleague, Dr. Catherine Haddon, who is a senior fellow and resident historian at the Institute for Government, and Kath leads our work on changes of government, ministers, and the workings of the constitution. So we've got plenty to discuss, but we're very keen to hear audience questions. There's a Q&A function that you can use to add your questions. There'll be a slight delay before they're published, uh, and we won't be able to get to all of them, I'm afraid, but we will do our best. Uh, you can also share your thoughts on Twitter. We are using hashtag IFG spats. So with that, let's get going. Polly, can I turn to you first and ask perhaps a, what's a general overview of the work and role of a special advisor and what's unique about that within government? So a special advisor is a civil servant, um, but on special terms and conditions, uh, which means that you can be let go of uh, in the blink of an eye, unlike the rather tortuous and arduous process it is to performance manage out somebody who is a, a, a permanent civil servant. Um, and, and often you will go with your minister or simply because you've pissed off your minister in one way or another. Um, and the absolute kind of fundamental role of a special advisor is to have that strong trusted relationship with your minister, which is why if that breaks down in the end, you you just have to go. Um, because the, the minister needs a range of support from their special advisor. The first is, um, uh, engagement with the party and with politics. You know, being a minister is an incredibly arduous, time consuming job, at least if you want to try and do it properly. And there's so much that you can't do. So you need somebody to advise you and stay connected to both the party in parliament and also the party more broadly and political thinking and commentary more, more widely and, and, and help to kind of help you to shape your vision, help you to take a view on things very quickly that you otherwise wouldn't have time to to think about wh whether that is policy or or media. Um, and obviously because the civil servant, uh, because the special advisor is not a, a permanent civil servant, they can have, whilst they can't be overtly political, they can't stand for office or, um, or in normal times make public statements. Nevertheless, they can, they, they've got a lot more latitude when it comes to who they talk to and the kind of relationships they can have within the political system. And that's really important because, you, you know, it's very easy for politics to get a, a bad name. But actually, in our system of democracy and party politics, if you haven't got a strong mechanism of support in the party, in the end, the government crumbles, it makes the government weaker and it makes it harder for the civil service and for the department to achieve its goals. Uh, so, you know, a good special advisor, therefore, is not the enemy of the civil servant. They're actually, they, they work kind of hand in glove together. 
both ensuring that, that as many people as possible can understand what the minister wants because the special advisor can go to a hell of a lot more meetings. There's a lot less gland handing as a special advisor. You can do a lot more actual work, um, but also because they can help the civil service to understand some of the political constraints that might be shaping the minister and help them to be just then more effective. I, I, I guess the, um, uh, the, the position has evolved, obviously, over time. There were, during the coalition years, there were kind of challenges and tensions because, you know, technically all special advisors are appointed by the Prime Minister. So there's me working for Nick Clegg uh, occasionally to try and sabotage the will of the Prime Minister in order to get something that was in a Liberal Democrat manifesto or because, you know, uh, th there is going to be a backbench rebellion from the Liberal Democrat Party that threatens the coalition. And perhaps it might be in the Prime Minister's enlightened self-interest that he supports that. But, you know, sometimes you are kind of then working against against them because of that coalition dynamic. The reality is though that that also can happen between departments because you're supporting your minister and sometimes the Home Office is pissed off with the business department and they're having a fight. Uh, and and so rivalries and, and, and then when it can get dangerous is when that gets to briefing and counter briefing because lots of special advisors do have that media role. That was never my role, but there are special advisors who are basically an additional additional press officer with a lot more freedom to get away with positive uh, political storytelling, but also kind of briefing and counter briefing. Uh, those roles have then obviously evolved even further. I, the, the, the crucial limitation that was certainly always put on it in my time and is now being kind of changed a bit is around you can't tell civil servants what to do and you can't manage them. And, and that was always a, an important constraint, even though, of course, you can tell civil servants what to do in that if you are fully aligned with your minister and what they want, the civil servants work for and to the minister. And therefore, so long as they know that they can trust you to be uh, genuinely speaking and, and sharing the views and opinions and mission of the, of the minister, then you can direct their work, even though you're not formally managing them. And when that relationship is successful, then absolutely they do work really closely together. The tension, I guess, is when um, it is certainly in the old world is if they thought that it wasn't the right thing to do or that the minister that you were freelancing. Basically, the best advice I got in the first kind of couple of days in Downing Street was from uh, a sort of veteran civil servant who'd been there in the Brown era. And he said, look, you you must never go to the wall for something unless you know that they will the, the minister will back you because if they if they overrule you your kind of your trust and status within the department or within number 10 as somebody who really has the kind of ear of the minister is gone and your power will just evaporate immediately so maintaining that relationship is incredibly important um I guess the the challenge now is if 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 a civil if if a civil servant is going to take direction very clearly from a special advisor who's been appointed by a kind of Tudor style court uh, mechanism of who happens to have favour and ear and the right relationships with whom, what is the process for accountability? Which is why this is such an interesting and uh, discussion today. If the buck doesn't stop with the minister who's accountable, then how do you how do you make sure that 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 special advisors who are making increasingly public statements, whether that's publishing blogs or saying things on Twitter, um, are are kind of pulled into the the democratic process more fully? Great, thank you, Polly. And as you say, that's definitely what we want to get into today. Um, David, if I can turn to you next, you were were cabinet minister for three years. How did you see the role of your special advisors? Did it align with what, what Polly's just described? And, and how do you think it has changed over the time you've been in government since, since the 80s, I guess? Well, I mean, the way it worked for me, as much as Polly described, um, but it was slightly different in each of the three cabinet jobs that I had, that um, when I was leader of the Commons, the um, and I, I, I didn't appoint a media special advisor. I, I didn't really see that there was a need for me to have that. But I had somebody who was very good on sort of the policy and the the legwork side. And, and I think you know, there were two key functions. Um, I mean, the first would be that um, when it came to vetting legislation, um, that the, my SPAD would be talking to his counterparts in other government departments about a draft bill. He'd be talking to the House of Lords 
um, the counterpart of his own working for the leader of the Lords. Um, and, you know, he come back to say, look, when you get Minister X in about this bill, uh, look, he, has, he hasn't clocked yet. that This is going to cause a major row in the House of Lords if he insists on having these Henry VIII powers in um, or this section of the bill um, drives the coach and horses through one of the devolution acts and you know, we're going to get the Scotland secretary up in arms about it. You know, there's no way that will ever go through. So we need to get him off that. So actually providing that vetting process in advance was really, really valuable um, to me. Um, and then also when I had the, my weekly um, sort of, if you like, PMQ's light, which is when you get the business statement on the Thursday and literally the leader of the Commons is given on Wednesday night the Prime Minister's briefing folders from the Wednesday afternoon because you can be asked business questions about absolutely everything. It, it's less intense and it's less well attended for a start, um, but it could be just as broad, probably broader because you're there for up to 90 minutes at the dispatch box. Uh, and again, my special advisor would would be very good at chasing up the um, the people on the government side of the house who might be wanting to come in. Um, we would try to work out which issues were going to come up sometimes. And we had a devil of a job trying to get a coherent, even a vaguely coherent line out of the relevant department for a story that had broken on that Thursday morning or overnight. Um, so when I went to justice, um, I did need to. I needed a, somebody specialised in policy, somebody specialised in media. And that was because the Ministry of Justice deals with um, some really big and politically risky operational areas of government. The Prisons and Probation Service is going to be a nightmare, whoever is in government and whoever is the minister, because by definition, the people you've got um, in prisons are not uh, going to have the greatest incentive to be cooperative and help the government of the day um, in managing its news agenda. Sometimes you felt justice that went for the Prison Officers Association even more so than the inmates. Um, but um, the uh, and, and you also had the courts um, and tribunal service, which had a whole lot of, of, of problems in its own right, of course, on very articulate um, lawyers who might come up with some comments at the drop of a hat and add in legal aid. You've got a big portfolio. And so I found that my media special advice was really good at you know, keeping uh, ear close to the ground, picking up, um, trying to give the early warning of when we might have a problem somewhere in the prison service. Um, uh, we've got this ghastly inspection report that's going to land on your desk in two days. Um, and before you actually see it, you need to think through how we're going to deal with these three key criticisms um, or there's a really good bit of work being done in this prison in getting inmates on release, work ready and into apprenticeships or into traineeships um, in a local business. And we should be highlighting that as an example of successful work by the prison service. So so the media special advisor came in really handy then. And then when I went to the cabinet office. Um, it, it changed again and. I came to the conclusion very rapidly that such authority and power as I was going to have in you know, this is post 2017 election, early 2018. So this is the really difficult time for the May government. But it was going to derive from there being uh, from, from, from there being no difference in public between me and the prime minister. And therefore, there's just a risk that if you if you're courting the media, uh, in any way that um, people open up gaps where you, you, they, you either want to keep those private or they actually don't exist at all. But I did need much more support in terms of policy and implementation of policy because I would I had a coordinating role chairing um, umpteen cabinet committees and ministerial working groups um, being in charge of the PM's implementation unit to to drive policy through um, and also having roles on devolution on Northern Ireland and Ireland and on the, the Brexit uh, negotiations, including towards the end of the cross party talks. So um, I needed to have a bigger team of policy focused advisors who were politically savvy and who worked effectively with civil servants 
uh, in, in the department and around Whitehall were trusted by them um, and respected by them, but who also could bring that political perspective to bear. And, I mean, how's it changed since the 80s? There's a lot more special advisors. I mean, mm. um, Margaret Thatcher in my day used to have us, all of us in and there were enough seats around what was then a rather smaller, shorter cabinet table than is, is the case today for all the special advisors in Whitehall to sit down. And it was absolutely terrifying because her first question was always, now tell me, what bright new ideas do your ministers have? And um, you knew if you told her something she hadn't been briefed on, your boss was going to get hauled in and clobbered with a handbag the next morning before <laughs> breakfast. So we all played safe. So they kind of, oh, very disappointing. It's supposed to be the bright young men and women. You've told me nothing you don't know already. I don't know already. So um, uh, that's changed. And in those days, there was not the same media profile for special mm -hmm. advisors there is now. Media was very different, of course, in those days. You no, know, didn't have the 24 hour bulletins or let alone the social media networks. Um, but Bernard Ingham really did uh, exercise authority over the whole government information machine. And I do have quite a lot of sympathy with those, including in the present government, where when they say that it's it, it, it has got over the years under successive governments a bit out of hand. And, um, you know, lots of us who've been ministers have been very frustrated. Sometimes you see a story in the newspaper that's sort of based on a half truth and, you know, it's some spad somewhere in Whitehall who's uh, gone out for a nice boozy lunch with a journalist somewhere and um, talked up their inside knowledge and, and given something that actually you then have to spend three days trying to sort out. Thank you very much. Um, a lot, lot in there to unpack, which I'm sure we were in the discussion, but I think that that final point is, is really helpful. Kath, can we turn to you now and, and perhaps can you just give us a sort of a quick overview of, you know, what are the changes that we understand this government is making and actually how much, as David alluded to, how much are they different from what previous governments have done in the past? Yeah, uh, that's a big question. So we'll we'll get into all of the detail of that. I think there's three buckets of uh, changes that have gone on um, recently. And it's worth remembering that actually in a lot of cases, number 10, or at least somebody briefing from number 10, has been keen to emphasise um, that these are changes, that there is an effort going on um, to try and control special advisors and to try and use them differently. The first one is uh, basically greater control over the SPAD network. And that's a really interesting question to, to debate about how much is that really different from, uh, you know, the time when uh, Nick Timothy and Fiona Hill were in charge over Theresa May or, um, you know, under Tony Blair's Downing Street. But the what we've heard is that uh, in the first instance, there was this much harder line about special advisors attending the Friday meetings. So at one point, they were going to be very early on a Saturday, I think, um, that Dominic Cummings would chair these meetings and that those meetings would be used to really coordinate um, what was going on out in departments uh, to send a message out from number 10 about what number 10 wanted. That's not very unusual. I mean, uh, number 10 have always used the special advisor network um, increasingly better to try and do that. And that's very sensible. But it was this idea that the special advisor network would be much more of a way for number 10 to reach into departments. So it was part of a sort of wider effort to get more control over um, the whole of Whitehall and for number 10 to use it as a form of power. So that's the sort of one of the changes. Um, I suspect the most visible part of the changes has been over hiring and firing and that's certainly been the most controversial one. We've seen uh, obviously the departure of Sonia Khan, a former special advisor at the Treasury where she was marched out of uh, number 10 by the police accused of uh, leaking and that's now led to an employment tribunal where the Prime Minister's chief advisor Dominic Cummings is being called in to testify. So that is certainly very unusual, not happened before. And um, though you have had obviously departures of special advisors in all sorts of circumstances, it's a very uh, precarious job to hold. Um, but that's a change in terms of how much control. Prime ministers have always had control over uh, the appointment of special advisors, but it's usually only ever a veto when there's a real objection to it. Uh, Margaret Thatcher objected to William Hague being made a special advisor when he was only 21, saying he was too young. Um, and um, 
David Cameron obviously objected to Dominic Cummings being made a special advisor um, very early on in his premiership and how things have changed since. But there was also obviously the departure of Sajid Javid as Chancellor when number 10 uh, in the reshuffle tried to, or when the Prime Minister tried to um, get him to basically remove his own spads and replace them with number 10's own appointments and create this number 10 um, Treasury Joint Special Advisor team. And again, a source of controversy and a much greater control um, move from number 10 there. And then finally, and the question that we really want to get into today is this question about whether accountability and scrutiny is changing or rather needs to change because of the more visible, more powerful role that special advisors are having. And uh, Polly and David have summed up a lot of the points about that. It's partly about how this fine line between instructing civil servants on behalf of a minister and then a, a special advisor having sort of power all of their own um, and how, you know, whether or not that fine line is crumbling now. And if so, should there be better scrutiny of what special advisors are doing, who is appointed to the post um, and in what ways they are accountable? Because at the moment they are accountable largely to their ministers. Um, and, you know, that's a really difficult question, especially when you looked at the career of David Frost, who has had a very executive role in terms of taking forward the Brexit negotiations and is has been appearing in front of select committees in order to fulfil that role and to, you know, let people have insights into what was going. Um, but it's really this big question about centralisation of the special advisers and how that is really undermining as well the traditional role that David and Polly have set out where special advisers were there to be a support to an individual minister if they're a sort of mechanism for number 10 um, across Whitehall are they failing to fulfill that core function? Thank you very much um, and lots of questions coming through already on this accountability issue so we'll definitely get into this. Um, Gavin, if I can turn to you now, um, you were Chief of Staff for, for two years um, for, uh, to Theresa May. How did you sort of manage the special advisors across government and how did you see this you know, accountability question? Were they working to you and the, the Prime Minister or were they working to their ministers primarily? So to take, to take your first question, we, we tried to reinstate the Friday meetings, the getting the special advisor team together briefing them on the key things that number 10 was looking to achieve and where we wanted their help and assistance. Uh, I think those meetings had sort of slightly fallen into abeyance previously. So we tried to build up a sort of team ethic between the special advisors. I think it is inevitable that uh, the, the degree of influence that number 10 has over the special advisor team to a degree depends on the political strength of the prime minister at the point in time. Uh, in terms of in terms of their role, as I saw it, I mean, clearly they were all ultimately appointed by the prime minister. And we made a point that when we made new appointments, we brought them in to meet the prime minister um, so that they actually had a little bit of time with the PM right near, towards the start of when they started their role. But I think it is really important that they have a clear link with the relevant minister as well. As David has explained, they perform a really important function for the ministers that they work with. And so in my experience, the best special advisors in the team that I managed were very good at managing the balance of their relationship with their individual minister and the fact that they also owed an allegiance to the prime minister and to number 10. And they would, you know, obviously we had a range of people in Theresa's cabinet ranging from people like David who were hugely supportive publicly and could have private conversations with the prime minister if he had points of concern um, through to people who were less helpful and who, you know, who we understood found elements, particularly on Brexit, elements of the government's policy uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But the best special advisors tried to help me manage those relationships. So they tried to understand where the prime ministers were coming from, what we were trying to achieve. They wanted to make sure that I understood what their ministers' concerns were and they wanted to work with me to try and see if we could find a way to resolve uh, those issues in, in, a, in a way that would work for the government. So, you know, I think there is a balance here. It is, a, you know, if, if you take, for example, if you take, um, Kath referred to what happened with Saj, I would draw a distinction there between what number 10 was trying to achieve, which I actually strongly support. I mean, I had 
talk to Philip Hammond about the difficult relationship number 10 and number 11 had and whether actually having a common team of economic advisors between the two of them would help make that relationship work better. I would con so I would I would support what they were trying to do. I think the way they went about it was almost inevitably only going to have the end that it had. Um, yeah. So I yeah. think when, when we get into some of the detail here, there's a distinction between objectives where I would have a lot of sympathy and um, the way in which they're being implemented, which hasn't always been ideal. So uh, just uh, well on, on, on your point generally about number 10, I mean, a lot of people who've worked in, in number 10 have said that it is relatively underpowered compared to other departments of state. You know, ministers, secretaries of state have have lots of civil servants, whereas number 10, you know, it's a very small team, lots of special advisors compared to other ministers, but but overall it's much smaller. So do you think that, you know, it, can you understand the PM's sort of objective here in centralising and the PM and his team's objective in centralising this network because it will allow them to deliver his priorities more effectively? Do you think that's that's reasonable? I, d I don't think you have to have complete central control of the entire special advisor network to do that. So, you know, I would make two points. The first is you're right that number 10, in terms of the number of people you've got in working in there on policy, is actually a pretty small pool of people. But what you know, what you want to do if you're prime minister, it seems to me, is appoint a David Liddington or whoever your equivalent is in the cabinet office, someone that you absolutely trust, because there is a large team of officials working in the cabinet office, whether that's the National Security uh, Security Secretariat or EDS or the various teams in there that also provide a very powerful tool for the Prime Minister. And one of the things that I regret, and David did really good work on it, but because we spent such a huge chunk of our time consumed by Brexit, you know, I always felt that we were probably 90% policy development and 10% checking whether the things we'd actually done were actually achieving what we wanted them to achieve. But that implementation unit in, in Cabinet Office is really powerful. The other thing I would say, you know, and I'm a little bit of a sort of Lincoln's team of equals view here, is that I think you get the most effective government when prime ministers appoint people who are talented ministers who won't always necessarily completely share the Prime Minister's gender, but give them the authority to drive their departments. You can't try and run the whole British government from one building. And you have you, you have to pick the issues which are most important to the Prime Minister, where the Prime Minister wants to have a detailed input in policy. And obviously, during my time there, Brexit was the predominant one of that. Um, and then you have to trust talented ministers to get on and drive other parts of the government's uh, agenda. And, and so, if you're asking me, do I have some sympathy about them wanting to make sure that the special advisor team is working for the government as a whole and we get rid of some of the behaviours that we certainly saw at points during the period when I was doing it? I have a lot of sympathy with that. But if the question is, should we try and run the whole operation from number 10? I don't think that's a sensible way forward. Uh, completely, completely makes sense. Polly, from, from your time in government, obviously, as you, you've sort of alluded to, you know, there were inevitable disagreements between the two halves of the coalition at times. Um, do you think would the Lib Dems have, have benefited from a sort of a stronger sense of centralisation or a stronger sense of team amongst your special advisors? Or was that was that already there? I'm not going to claim that it paid enormous political dividends, but nevertheless, I think actually working as a coherent team, we accomplished very well. That's partly because. So to start off with the Deputy Prime Minister, basically, you know, like, I don't know, two men and a dog working for him and was trying to scrutinise all of government whilst having a tenth of the resources of already, as we know, at a very undermanned number 10. So an over, basically it took us two years to get up to having a, a, a kind of phalanx of special advisors. We got up to about 16 by the end. Um, and But because of the controversy of trying to put a special advisor support into a junior minister in a department who might then have access to the department or try and con contradict the sector. Anyway, that, that was considered too sensitive. So they all worked for the Deputy Prime Minister. They all had a desk in the Deputy Prime Minister's office. Everybody who was a Liberal Democrat special advisor had came to, you know, not just a, 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 a one meeting on a Friday, but, a, you know, an 8.30 meeting every single day. And that's possible when you're dealing with 16, 20 people. It's not possible when you're dealing with the kind of hundred that it practically gets up to on the wider thing. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, it's a whole different story as to how you create a functioning coalition government and maybe we'll never need to worry about it. So I, I don't want to get into that rabbit hole, really. 
that is fair enough. Kath, can I ask you a, a question about some of these individual kind of high profile advisors? Um, do you do you think that these these kind of roles like Dominic Cummings, like David Frost, you know, are they new? Haven't we always had high profile advisors in number 10? Yes, we've had high profile advisors and we've had very controversial advisors. I mean, even when they first occurred in 1964, you know, the idea was that they would undermine the civil service as uh, was too political a role, etc. Um, and so that in itself isn't necessarily new. It's worth remembering Nick Timothy, Fiona Hill were very controversial and um, you know, after their departure, after the, the 2017 election, um, you know, you heard a lot more stories about what the problems had been at the centre of government that, you know, were put at their feet. So in that respect, some of what's going on at the moment um, isn't new. Um, there's an argument that, you know, Dominic Cummings, you know, it's a very visible role. There's um, a lot of, I don't know whether it, you'd call it myth around him, um, but certainly he seems to revel in the role of being sort of a lightning rod um, for some of what is thrown, would otherwise be thrown at the prime minister. Um, and obviously there's a there's a strong leaking culture in this government. Um, we, you know, we saw that again over the course of Theresa May's government, uh, various attempts to try and stamp it out at the beginning beginning of government, you know, is in the ministerial code that, that leaking will not be tolerated, um, but it seems to depend on by whom. So some of these issues aren't at all new. I think the key is just why it's so important, these issues of scrutiny and accountability um, are the questions about what kind of roles are actually special advisors doing. And perhaps this is a question we should always have asked of, especially if you've got very powerful um, special advisors close to the prime minister, just fully understanding what are the organisations that they oversee, the committees that they run, if they are sort of chairing, you know, particular meetings, um, who do they manage in terms of special advisors, uh, and also being very clear about that dividing line um, between being able to instruct civil servants on behalf of your minister, and if that is the prime minister, that's a pretty powerful um, sort of you know weapon to have that many people in number ten have always used. Um, but the dividing line between that and then being able to manage and direct civil servants in a way that does contravene both the civil service code and also the special advisor code, and that's I think the key question that we've got to be asking. Um, I haven't seen anything that sort of, you know, is entirely clear either way. It's worth remembering uh, there was an order in council was made in 1997 by Robin Butler when this issue came up about um, Alistair Campbell in his comms role and Jonathan Powell as chief of staff being able to instruct civil servants. And actually Robin came to regret that um, because there were other workarounds that they could have used and the order in council probably exacerbated the problem. So there has been a long tradition of trying to sort of slightly ignore this issue um, and the blurring of the lines in order that special advisors can do their job. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's not an entirely new issue. But I think it's one that this government in particular is sort of pushing the limits of um, and therefore is making us ask these questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David, just to sort of go on from that, you know, you talked about how how valuable you have found the work of your special advisors, how, you know, they have sort of brought that extra kind of degree of, of policy heft to your time in the cabinet office in particular. Would what what would your reaction be to sort of, you know, request for more scrutiny about what your special advisors spend their time doing, what exactly the nature of their relationship with the civil servants is. How how would you see that from a from a minister's point of view? I think I think that it, it it's perfectly reasonable for Parliament to know if a special advisor has been given authority to direct civil servants. But otherwise, I think that the principle remains correct that it is the minister who is accountable to Parliament for his or her activities on behalf of the government. Um, I do think that there is a, a, a serious question, I mean, Catherine's right, about, about uh, accountability here. Um, I mean, David Frost, who, who I've always liked because he got on fine with, um, is in a, a very unusual position where he's making public speeches and um, giving press conferences um, when he is, uh, he, he's also a, 
uh, he's supposed to advise her he's not directly accountable to Parliament in any way, nor is any minister other than the Prime Minister able to go and account to Parliament for what David says or does. And I, I mean, I think the, the obvious way to put that right will be in a, you know, a the next government reshuffle is to make him a minister in, in, in the House of Lords. Um, and I think that that would solve that. At the moment, it's an awkward situation. Um, there may be a case for doing to the Special Advisors Code what has been done with the Civil Service Code, which is to put it on a statutory basis, because I do worry at the fact that Special Advisors you know, for all the mythology about them, are actually some of the least protected employees, um, certainly in Whitehall, probably anywhere in the country in terms of statutory protection. Mm. Equally, I think there's a strong case for saying that as with ministers, there should be a limit in law upon the number of salaried political advisers that there can be in government at any one time. But that you know, if the government wants to go to Parliament and make the case for varying that ceiling, well, then that's open to a government to do. But I, I think that it would be wrong for us to slip towards uh, uh, the, the idea that you see in some quarters of the press that that, you know, the Prime Minister of the day or number 10 under you know, whoever's uh, in government um, some uses a squad of political advisers of, of uh, growing numbers to direct Whitehall in a way that makes political decision making less accountable to the elected parliament than it ought to be under our constitution. The prime minister, though very important in terms of determining the outcome of the general election, you know, the qualities of the leader matter, but you know, the prime minister is the person who can command the majority in the House of Commons uh, and, and therefore parliamentary accountability seems to be absolutely critical here. Great, thank you. And um, Pat, I think you wanted to come in on the SPAD code, the Special Advisor Code of Conduct. Yes, thanks. Uh, I happen to have the Constitution Reform and Government Act of 2010 up. It does actually mention the Special Advisors Code um, in the same way as the Civil Service Code that there should be one. But it also does say that, um, you know, subject to any sort of uh, particular um, caveat, Special Advisors Code must provide that a Special Advisor may not authorise expenditure of public funds, exercise any power in relation to the management of any part of the civil service of the state or otherwise exercise any power conferred by or under this or any other act or power of Her Majesty's prerogative, which is basically giving that sort of umbrella of what it is that they are not allowed to do that civil servants or ministers, importantly, are able to do in terms of accountability. So it's there, um, but it's therefore, you know, the difficulty is who holds this up? Because as Polly said at the very start, special advisors are civil servants. They're temporary civil servants appointed by the political party. So in a sense, their protection is the civil service. But it's very difficult for the civil service to do that because they are creatures of a political party. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think that ties well into, into one of the questions we've had. So I'm going to take some questions from the audience Q&A now. So first up from uh, John McTurnan, who was uh, an advisor to Tony Blair and now works at the Institute, amongst other places. He's picking up on this point. He said some special advisors are now able to manage and direct civil servants uh, without, it seems, an order in council, as, as Kath mentioned, was, was the case in the past. How has that happened, given where we're thought to be with civil service rules? And what should now happen? Do we are we moving towards full and open political appointments to the senior civil service or do we need different codes of conduct and scrutiny for those two or three individual spads uh, who, who manage civil servants? Um, Polly, if I can put you on the spot, um, do you think do you think we need uh, more political appointments to the senior civil service or do we just need to change the rules for one or two individuals? So I think I think giving ministers the freedom to appoint talented people who can help them deliver their agenda is really important. Um, uh, so when Michael Gove was running the Department for Education, I think he did a good job of bringing in um, not just Dominic Cummings, who, uh, as Kath mentioned, was originally rejected by uh, by the centre, but, uh, but Sam Friedman, an education policy expert who was able to work in his private office and also uh, Tim Loinig, again, slightly later, 
he came in as a special advisor and then and then moved into a more civil service role. He's now, I don't know, chief scientist somewhere or other. I lose track. He seems to have all the jobs in government. But he's a brilliant man who uh, and and I whether 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 they come through political appointments, ministerial appointments, which I guess isn't quite the same. We do need to find pathways in for brilliant people with an agenda that the minister shares, but nevertheless, who are real experts. And I, and I, th I think that's definitely a gap. I, I would much rather we um, we found ways to strengthen ministers' private office with those kinds of expertise rather than civil servants who are largely brilliant generalists. And that's an extraordinary skill. So we shouldn't denigrate it. But it means that if you're looking for somebody who actually has this vision of um, how to deliver a particular reform, uh, whether I know police and crime commissioners, a, an advisor was brought into the Home Office for that, um, or or uh, a, 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 um, schools reform. You know, the, what are the alternatives to bringing somebody into government? I think they are alternatives which have involve kind of less scrutiny or more patronage. One alternative is that you basically take that expert and you give them a peerage, chuck them in the House of Lords forever, just because they're useful to deliver a minister's agenda for three years, uh, or else you take a minister, somebody who's already in the House of Lords and give them a ministerial job to deliver that, even though it, maybe they're not an expert. Or you do something like setting up the ex an external organisation like the New Schools Network, which sits outside of government and then gets funded by government. Uh, and to me, that feels like less accountability. So um, I... I I, I, th I think we do need to recognise that there is there is there is a kind of a, a gap in what the civil service can do that ministers need to be better supported on. I, I, I think that those don't necessarily need to be party political appointments, but some of the best special advisors, uh, you know, Giles Wilkes, who's a senior fellow at the Institute for Government, have a, a kind of innate and natural disdain for party politics, which makes them actually very effective as in helping to deliver whilst being outside the formal structures of the civil service, which creates uh, problems of its own when it comes to kind of success, <laughs> I'm afraid. Absolutely. Um, Gavin, if I could turn to you, I mean, any thoughts you have on, on that scrutiny question generally, but also that picks up a, a question which is from an anonymous viewer uh, saying, are SPADs more effective coming into the role as generalists or departmental specialists? Are there some departments which require subject specialists from your time? As chief of staff, did you presumably you saw both types of advisors? What was your reflection on on the pros and cons of specialist versus generalist special advisors? I think you need both. I mean, I think Polly's answered that very succinctly. I think uh, there, there's an increasing role for media special advisors, so they clearly have to have specialist communication skills. Um, you know, I think of I can think of people that were brought in during Theresa's time who had specific expertise in a particular uh, department. John Yates at DfE, for example. Um, but there's definitely also a role, and certainly in number 10, you need people that can look across the whole piece and are, are not experts in any one particular area, but are generalists. Uh, on the wider debate, look, I mean, I would, I would make two points. The, the first is, there is uh, there, unless you create, unless you put special advisors into jobs that they haven't been doing before, there is absolutely no need there to give special advisors a power to direct civil servants. If civil servants believe two things about you, one, that you know the mind of the minister that you are working for, and two, that you are representing that minister's views, not your own agenda, which you wish to see implemented, then if you say the prime minister thinks X, they will take your word for it and get on and do whatever it is that you've, you've said the prime minister wants to do. And as Polly was saying earlier, if you ever get it wrong, then your authority is shot for good. Uh, so you have to exercise that very, very carefully. Now, we've we've got into a situation now in at least one case in terms of David Frost uh, and possibly I don't know the details so much there in terms of Lee. But, you know, I would argue that that national security advisor job should not be being done by a political appointment. The role of political advisors is to provide political advice to ministers. There is a completely separate and important role for the prime minister to have uh, a national security advisor who is advising, providing expert advice you know, across the piece in terms of the national security front. And, and, you know, you 
Well, you'll have seen Teresa's views on that question from the question she asked Michael Gove on the floor of the House. In his current role, and I think David Lington was sort of alluding to this, it seems to me that David Frost at the moment is David Davis. He, he is the person reporting to the Prime Minister who is leading our negotiations. And, you know, that does raise questions of parliamentary accountability when that person isn't a minister. I mean, actually, one of the more one of the issues that this touches on is Parliament's increasing desire to hold civil servants to account. So Theresa was quite frustrated when Mark Sedwell as National Security Advisor or Ollie Robbins as um, her, her, her Sherpa were being called to give evidence before select committees because her view was that there are ministers that are responsible for those policy areas and they are the people that Parliament should be holding to account. Thank you. And a related question, perhaps to David, I mean, what would your sense be if 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 there were to be greater scrutiny of special advisors uh, as, as individuals, as, as Gavin's just alluded to, you know, would it be select committee hearings and would that be beneficial or would that just descend into sort of, you know, partisanship and kind of party politics? No, I, mean, I, I don't think it would be beneficial really for the, for the reasons Gavin Gavin gives. And, and, and I think that um, you can't have this discussion about the role of social advisors without um, you know, discussing what changes would mean for the standing and uh, ability of a minister to carry through uh, government policy, to take decisions and to be accountable to parliament for them. Um, so I, I was very much with um, uh, Theresa May in terms of this being uncomfortable with um, uh, Ollie and, and uh, Mark and others being uh, summoned to appear before and I had it with, with um, John Manzoni myself and you know, we solved that in the end largely through the fact that you know he John when John went in front of a select committee he went with me um, uh, and, and so there was always a minister there in the, and just as in most ministerial appearances they are supported by select committee by, uh, by uh, civil servants from their their department so my view is that the uh, the SPAD's advice should be to the minister. And it's up to the minister whether he or she accepts the special advisor's advice or rejects it. And the minister has to take responsibility for for that. Um, so, yeah, a straight answer is, 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 is no, I don't think that's healthy. And I think that one of the, the risks in what is the, the attempt now to centralise uh, the control of the special advisors um, is that if you're not careful, and I, I agree with Gavin what, what he said earlier about the need for stronger, more cases central government, but the risk is you end up by diminishing the authority of ministers within their departments. And certainly if we were ever to get to a situation where the special advisor was seen by the minister as being a, sort of a spy from the centre sent to keep watch on him or her, then I think we'd be into a, a very unstable government and, and very unstable set of relationships between government and parliament. Absolutely. And, and that relates to a question which we've got uh, in the Q&A from Dave Penman from the FDA. Um, who, and he said it's clear that the current practice is to centrally manage SPADs by the PM's chief of staff, who is also a special advisor, um, and to rotate them amongst among ministers. Uh, so I think this goes to your point, David, about you know them being sort of much more kind of closely controlled by number ten. Does the panel agree that this undermines the role of ministers, hinders the work of government, and dilutes accountability? Um, who who would like that one? It's a big question there. Um, Me, Holly, I, I'm happy to say. Please, yes. Sorry, but I just yes, totally agree with um, with that. Because you have to recognise what being a minister is. I mean, I've never been a minister, so perhaps uh, David will correct me and say it's dead easy. But I don't think it is. Like any leadership role is is emotionally draining. It's isolating. You're you're in this department. You're going. You're surrounded by people who who, who have been there and done it for way longer than you. And uh, and and to find your identity, your leadership, your mission within that role, you, you need some allies, some people who you know who've got your back. And of course, sometimes that turns into they've got your back because they're thinking about how they can get into number 10 by making you the prime minister, of course. And, and, and we should 
stamp on that wherever you can. But you need people around you who you trust. And, and your reality is that even the best uh, PPS or, you know, the person running your diary is somebody you've never met before. They don't know. They don't know about anything about you. And in order to get the best out of ministers, they need people who are on their side, who they have chosen. And and I think that the prime minister should go back to that strong view that it's only if the minister wants to wants to hire somebody who is uh, basic, you know, profoundly problematic to the high functioning of government, then it should be the minister's choice. We should look after our ministers better. Kath, do you have anything to, to add on that? I don't know, you know, the, the yeah. role that SPAS play to support their ministers in particular. Yeah, I mean, I, I thoroughly agree with everything that um, Polly's just said in terms of SPADs play a hugely important role in supporting ministers and they play a role that civil servants can't play um, in terms of the political aspects of the role, whether that's sort of, you know, uh, talking to parts of the party, talking to other MPs, whether that's thinking about the electoral prospects of it. And it's just simply having somebody close to you that you really trust, that you're working with day in, day out. That's why the personal relationship is so important. But I think there's a bigger issue to all of this, especially when we're talking about accountability, um, it's, it's particularly for the prime minister's special advisors. And that goes to the power of the prime minister and the power of his cabinet as somebody has put to us um ultimately if the center has more control over ministers spads it is because the prime minister has control over those ministers you know the spads behave how the ministers want them to and if this some of this could represent um just simply where we are in this premiership where the cabinet is um and at a different time you will see a resurgence of it and i you know we're we know there's a great quote in our Ministers Reflect from Ken Clark, where he talks about number 10, you know, trying to get control, uh, sending their people over and so forth. And, you know, the rude words that he sent them off with. Um, and it just goes to show that a lot of this is just about cabinet prime minister dynamics. Absolutely. And I, just as an aside, I would encourage everyone to read Ken Clark's Ministers Reflect. It is, a, it is. as good as you would imagine. Um, Very good. It, absolutely. Gavin, just just on that point, you, you mentioned about, you know, uh, your time as chief of staff, the, the prime minister was dealing with a lot of issues and the party was quite divided on obviously the Brexit question. Uh, it's in a very different situation now. The prime, prime minister is very powerful as a safe parliamentary majority. Um, as that changes, as it might, you know, through events, um, will that have an impact on on the strength of his advisors within the sort of network of advisors generally? Yeah, look, I think that the prime minister's advisors, the, the power of you as an advisor is defined by the power of the prime minister. Uh, the stronger the prime minister is, the more if you're the prime minister's chief of staff and you go and see a cabinet minister, they're going to put greater weight on what you're telling them if the prime minister is in a very powerful position within their government. That's that's inevitable. Um, on the earlier question, I, I would I would just make two, two small points. So I, I certainly agree with the point about the dangers of drawing advisors away from their ministers uh, and what both Polly and Kath said on that. I do think involving the chief of staff in sort of appraising advisors is fine as long as it's done with the minister. I mean, I think that reflects the reality that they are both working for their minister, but also ultimately appointed by number 10. And, and if, if that's done sensibly, that can actually help to manage those relationships. I also have one view, which is kind of maybe slightly heretical for someone who was the PM's chief of staff, which is I think that we've got into a problem in our politics where politicians become too reliant on their advisors and don't put enough weight on their relationships with their senior colleagues. You know, it is inevitable. You know, if I think about the two and a bit years in which I did that job, I spent nearly every waking hour of the working week with the prime minister. Uh, so they are going to spend far more time with their senior advisor than they are with the chancellor or the foreign secretary or the home secretary or other senior cabinet ministers. But those relationships between the senior politicians in a government are so critical to the good functioning of that government. And I do sometimes think that we've got too much into a sort of advisor culture uh at the expense of thinking about building effective teams between those senior politicians uh, that's very interesting um 
I think I want to come back to that, but but if I may, just one quick question. You mentioned the chief of staff role. I mean, formally, Boris Johnson doesn't have a chief of staff. It, from from what you know, is is Dominic Cummings effectively playing the role that you played? I think I think Dominic is the closest to the role that I played. I mean, the most important definition of the chief of staff role. I'd, uh, I'd be interested in David's view as well, but I would say the most important definition is who is the prime minister's senior political advisor. Who, when there is something very serious happening, who is the one person that the Prime Minister will call into the room and have a private conversation about what do we do now? And Dominic, I think, clearly is that person for this government. I think Eddie is performing some of the functions uh, that I would have performed. And I think one of the things that I find slightly frustrating about the media coverage of this government is there is almost an obsession about Dominic and an ignoring of the fact that there are, you know, if you look at the people that are in number 10, in the senior political advisor roles, you've got a group of people from the Leave campaign of whom Dominic is clearly the most important and they are very influential. But there are also people that have worked with the Prime Minister from back when he was Mayor of London from City Hall, Manera, uh, Eddie, Ben Gascoigne, and those people are also influential. They have the Prime Minister's ear. And so I sometimes feel when I read the media coverage of this number 10 that it is, it is telling a slightly simplistic uh, version of the story. But if you're asking me who is the closest person in this structure to the job uh, that I did and that Nick and Fee did and that Ed Llewellyn and Jonathan Powell did, uh, then I would say um, that that's Dominic. It's not in exactly the same role, but he's the closest person to it. That completely makes sense. Thank you. Um, David, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but also the, the, the earlier point that Gavin raised about, you know, does this government is is how this government approaches special advisors and the use of the special advisor network is that kind of symptomatic of its general approach to centralizing decisions in number 10 and and thereby sort of disempowering individual cabinet ministers i think so just on, on, on the first point i i i i agree with gavin's sort of pithy summary of, of of what the role of the chief of staff is i mean when i was um in the cabinet I think before i was in the cabinet as a minister you know the chief of staff, um, whether it was Gavin or to Ed Llewellyn, um, before whom Nick and Fee in their time, you you was the person that you knew you needed to get to and through if you wanted to get a message or proposal to the prime minister directly. The only the other option you had, of course, was to get hold of the prime minister in the House of Commons. But because the hours are um, uh, uh, shorter than they used to be when I was first elected and because, which actually is part of the explanation for the problem Gavin identified yep. over, over cabinet ministers not getting together to, to, to chat informally. Um, uh, but the, because, of, because of that, that's, that's the, the opportunities are fewer. Um, on the more general point, um, I agree with what Gavin said at the start of our session that there is a very strong case for a more coherent and stronger centre of government. Um, I, I found it very frustrating at times in the cabinet office uh, as I became aware that so often policy making, policy implementation and the allocation of finance to deliver that policy were all three separate operations yes. that seemed at times to take part in distinct silos at different times and in different parts of Whitehall with different people taking the decisions. And so the idea behind trying to uh, bind number 10, Cabinet Office and the Treasury more closely to ensure greater cohesion is something that I would very much support. But like Gavin, I don't think you need to you know, to break all the crockery before you redecorate the kitchen. You know, it, it's, um, it, 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 it's it's the method, I think, that is the problem. And I think that any prime minister, when he or she is at the zenith of their power, they've got a new electoral mandate perhaps behind them, they're popular in the polls, their, their power over their cabinet ministers is um, you know, pretty, 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 uh, pretty big. But Every prime minister faces a time, and not necessarily in the first term, but every prime minister faces a time when they plummet in the polls, when they have a real problem, perhaps of their own making, perhaps an external event that's um, causing a serious problem for them, when they need those cabinet colleagues to trust them and work with them, and to have cabinet colleagues who are recognised by number 10 and by the wider public and parliament as having as being authoritative 
weighty, knowledgeable figures in their own right, because otherwise the government as a whole suffers. Thank you. Um, we we are basically out of time. I want to finish with one final question to to Polly, where we who I started with. Um, just you know, as from from having been a special advisor, from sort of working very closely with uh, the DPM, what one thing would would you like to see differently about how this this government is is working with and and using special advisors? I, I think it comes down to that point about trusting and respecting the the diversity of thought that you need. You know, they like to talk about neurodivergence and I, they don't really mean it. They just mean people like Dom. And um, and, and that I, I think you have to recognise that you, you need a, a strong centre. You need to be able to coordinate towards strategic goals, but you also need to respect the 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 depth of knowledge and understanding that is needed to run a department well. And it comes down to the prime minister and the minister. The special advisor will only uh, cause problems and backbite if their minister wants them to. And if the prime minister can't get the minister to agree to a strategy and agree to pursuing that strategy together, that is the problem. So trying to blame the special advisors and sort of assume that you can you can create a national government strategy by bullying, hectoring and micromanaging a group of in of servants of staff is just fundamentally wrong. Uh, they should they should work out how to have good trusting relationships with the ministers and let the ministers get the support they need. Great. I think that's a perfect place to stop. So we will end there. Thank you, everyone very much for uh, joining us. Thank you, huge, huge thank you to our fantastic panel, uh, Lord Gavin Barwell, Sir David Liddington, Polly McKenzie and Catherine Haddon. Uh, just to say quickly, this is part of a programme of work we're doing on special advisors. Uh, so watch the IFG website for more on this in coming weeks. And this video will be available to watch back online uh, very soon. Thank you all.